So we want to move on from mirrors to lenses, but before we get into lenses in detail, we're going to look at three different uh, optical properties, index of refraction, Snell's law, and total internal reflection. These are going to help us understand how lenses work a little more fully. So to start off with, let's look at refraction. We've already talked about refraction back when we looked at wave properties. We said this is one of the things that waves do, but we didn't really look at any of the math behind refraction. So I showed you some similar pictures before, how we get these kind of optical illusions where the straw seems to go this way, and then in the water it seems to go a different direction. What's happening there is that the light is bending or changing directions when it goes from one medium or one material to another. So in this example there would be a pencil that actually is a straight pencil and its uh, physical presence is here. And so light leaving the tip of the pencil is going to travel in a straight line, but when it reaches this surface it bends up a little bit and our perception is that light travels in straight lines, so we perceive the pencil here even though it's located over here. And I showed you this picture previously, I believe. So one of the explanations, one way that we can visualize why the light changes direction when it goes from one medium to another is because the speed of light in one material is different from the speed of light in another material. And when it slows down or speeds up at the transition, that causes it to change direction. So here's one example. If you got a bunch of soldiers marching, and they're on solid ground here, and over here they're going to hit some mud. Those that hit the mud are going to slow down, and so these guys have already slowed down, and these guys haven't slowed down yet, and that causes the direction change. Uh, here is the example that I like better a barrel rolling. So you can see here when this side hits the grass it's going to slow down, that's going to cause it to tilt. If it's rolling in the opposite direction, this side is going to speed up first and it will tilt back the other way. Okay, so all of this has to do with changing speeds in different materials. So we define what's called the index of refraction and that is essentially getting at the speed of light in different objects. Uh, officially, it's defined as the speed of light c. If you remember, that's 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, divided by the velocity of light in that specific material. So in material. So c is specifically the speed of light in vacuum, and whenever light is in anything but vacuum, it always slows down a little bit. In air, just a tiny, tiny bit, and most of the time we're going to ignore that, and we're just going to call uh, n of air equal to 1, because we're not going to draw it out to four decimal places. Water, we're going to use this one a lot, so you might want to jot that one down, 1.33. And then you can see there's other materials where it goes even slower. Diamond goes really slow, uh, which leads to some of the uh, optical properties of diamond. So here's our definition. n is the index of refraction. All right, so what this means is if n is larger, that means that the uh, speed of light is slower in that material because you're dividing by uh, a smaller number here, so that's going to make n larger, uh, and then c is constant. So what that does is if I move from the air over here, we've got n equals 1, approximately one. There's no units on n, by the way, which you can see because these are both velocities, so the meters per second will cancel out. So if n equals one over here in the air and n equals 1.33 here in water, that means it's traveling slower here in water. So if you think of that barrel rolling, it's going to hit this edge first and it will tilt toward the normal. We measure these angles with respect to the normal just um, by convention. I mean, you could do it with respect to the horizontal. You could measure this angle and this angle, and all the math would work out the same. You just have to change <clears throat> your convention a little bit. Okay, if we have a flashlight in the water, the light is going to come out, and then it's going to speed up <clears throat> as it goes into the air, and so that is going to make it tilt the other way. <clears throat> so in general, whenever you're going from a 
lower index of refraction to a higher, then the ray bends toward the normal. Whenever you're going from a higher to a lower, it bends away from the normal. There's also a reflected ray, which we're not going to do a whole lot with as far as calculations are concerned. But some of the energy, some of the light does bounce off and some of it gets transmitted. And this follows the law of reflection that we already saw. So this here would be equal to theta 1. It would be reflected symmetrically like so. Okay, a uh, couple of other I guess uh, manifestations of this. If you're looking at somebody in a lake, their foot is here, the light is leaving, it goes to a lower index of refraction so it bends away from the normal and so somebody on the beach here would actually see their foot up here and they would look like they have short stubby legs. Um, and one other thing here, if you have a piece of glass and the light is going to go from the air to the glass, it's going to bend toward the normal, but then when it goes from the glass back to the air, it will bend back away from the normal by the same amount that it bent toward. So here, the net effect is not changing the direction of the, um, of the light, but it does shift it over a little bit. So you can have effects like that. Okay, let's look at the equation we're going to use for index of refraction in addition to uh, C over V. So we've got that one already. And that one doesn't really have a name other than the definition of the index of refraction. But this here is known as Snell's law. Snell measured it experimentally. And this tells us exactly how much, by what angle, the light is going to bend depending on the indices of refraction of the materials. And we can derive this pretty easily. If we've got this triangle here, so it's got length L1 there, it's got this side of length A, and then this side, then we can say sine of theta 1, so sine of this angle here is opposite over hypotenuse, so that is going to be L1 over A. And then we can have another little triangle here, this guy here. So that guy is going to be theta 2, this is going to be L2 here, and they share the same hypotenuse. So sine of theta 2 equals L2 over A. Well, that's an ugly looking A there. But. Now this length here uh, is how far it travels in a given time. So we can substitute in uh, velocity times time, velocity 1 over a, and then we can substitute in for this guy velocity 2. So the reason it doesn't travel far, as far is because this velocity 2 is less than velocity 1 times a given time over a. And then if I divide these two equations, I'm going to have sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 equals v1t over a over v2t over a. The ta stuff is going to cancel out, so you're just going to get this expression here. So we can multiply these v's over, so I'm going to get v2 sine theta 1 equals v1 sine theta 2. And then if I substitute in here, if I rearrange this, so I get V equals C over N, then I'm going to have, um, let's see, C over N2 sine theta 1 equals C over N1 sine theta 2. C's go away, and then we multiply across again. I guess I shouldn't have multiplied them there. That would have been quicker. Anyway, we end up with Snell's Law. Sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2. Yay! I guess I could have just boxed that one up there. So nice, simple formula here. All right. We will do some calculations with that later. Another property that happens with... Um, refraction is what we call total internal reflection. And before I get into this, let me show you. Um, this is another FET applet, so you go to FET.colorado.edu. This one is called Bending Light. So here I've got my light ray, 
and there's my reflected ray and then the transmitted ray here and as I change my angle according to Snell's law I'm going to change the transmitted angle as well if I'm straight up and down then it goes straight through obviously and uh, <clears throat> that still obeys Snell's law because you just have sine of zero for both of them, zero equals zero, so that's all good. If we change the index of refraction here, essentially if we increase it, we're slowing it down more, so that makes it bend toward the normal more. If we decrease it, it bends less. So there are some uh, things that we already talked about. Now if we shoot the laser from the other side, it doesn't let me move this down, so I'm going to have to switch the water up here and then the air down here so what happens now is it bends away from the normal because it's speeding up but if I get to a certain point here and this only happens when I'm going from high to low because you get more bend over here than you had over here there's a certain point where it goes all the way oops too far where your transmitted ray is going parallel to the boundary and if you go beyond that point then there's no transmitted ray and all of it is reflected and this is called total internal reflection and it actually has some good applications but let's look back at that equation so we wanted that uh, transmitted angle to be 90 degrees and so we plug in sine of 90 there we just divided this n1 over here this came from n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. So we set theta 2 equal to 90 and then we called sine theta we called theta 1 theta c for the critical angle. The critical angle is the angle at which you first have total internal reflection. If the angle is anything greater, if theta is greater than or equal to the critical angle, then you will always have total internal reflection and uh, <clears throat> sine of 90 is just 1 so you just end up with the sine of the critical angle is equal to the ratio of uh, the indices of refraction and this again it only happens when you're going from higher index of refraction to lower index of refraction and if you solve this for theta you're just going to get arc or arc sine of the ratio of the indices of refraction and this is going to be the higher one here right because that's what we started with and this is going to be our lower index of refraction okay a uh, couple of applications of total internal reflection oh wait first a little diagram kind of showing you what I saw with the an what you saw with the animation already so here some gets transmitted there it gets lower and lower at a certain point it's just transmitted parallel to the boundary and if you go beyond that it's all gonna reflect back so this has um, some interesting optical properties. They use these with really nice expensive binoculars because you can get 100% of the light energy transmitted this way. Most binoculars use lenses and mirrors and those uh, don't transmit all of the light. There's always a little bit reflected, um, or the, the mirror doesn't reflect all of it. So these are actually uh, the best binoculars you can get and another cool application is what is called a fiber optic so what's going on there is you have sort of a glass tube but it's flexible I guess it's plastic I don't know what it's made of but they coat it with a reflective surface on the inside and so as long as you're always at beyond the critical angle you can send a beam of light through there and you can even bend this plastic tube so you get all these tubes and none of the light comes out of the edges because it would <coughs> require a steeper angle to do that so you always get total internal reflection and all the light just comes out of the end they make little lamps and stuff out of these and uh, you can pass a signal if you have a bundle of these fibers you know you could pass an entire image through it and we can also send information if you've heard of Google Fiber which is ridiculously fast internet they actually send the internet data over fiber optics okay that's all see you next time